In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Welcome back, everybody, to The Deal Board. It's episode 103. We've now crossed all over the 100 episode mark. If you haven't heard our 100th episode, you should go back in, in here. It was a pretty great one. But today, we also have a great episode for you today. We're doing one of our business owner story episodes where I get a chance to interview Brian Clayton from My Green Pal. And we also have another uh, recurring kind of guest on the show, right, Andy? Yeah, we do. We have uh, Barry Sloan from New Tech Business Solutions. And if you haven't seen Barry, uh, I guess you're not watching enough news channels because uh, Barry's all over them talking about new tech and their small business solutions. And and Barry just comes on for an update because there's so much going on as we come out of this coronavirus uh, pandemic. There's so many programs out there that have been initiated either because of the CARES Act or even before the CARES Act. And so Barry kind of covers what's currently out there. It's really, there's a lot of money. And just to get caught up with what's going on at New Tech, it's a, it's a great update. It's great, uh, great services for small businesses. Yeah. And with my interview with Brian, I think our overall theme for today is growth. So a lot of times we'll be talking to small business owners. And, and one of the first steps in the business brokerage process is getting a valuation or understanding what the business is worth. And, and sometimes that number is not exactly where you would want it to be. Um, so we talk a lot about growth in both of these interviews today. And there is a way to grow your company into the valuation that you want to get. If you plan ahead of time, Brian talks a lot about his journey of starting as a young, small entrepreneur. I don't want to ruin too much of it. And, and growing to a larger exit that he was eventually able to do. But we've we've run into other examples of this too, right? Yeah, we've seen this before. We've had business owners come to us. And of course, they have a number in mind. Maybe they have a few partners and they each want to get a million dollars or they have a $5 million number in their head. And that's exactly what happened to us up in our Jacksonville office. Uh, John Guywitz was approached by a company and they said, hey, we want $5 million. And John was like, well, you're not worth $5 million. And they said, well, what can we do to get to $5 million? And so John said, well, you need to do this, this, and this. And they said, well, would you help us by meeting with us every, I think it was every six months or so, just to sit down, look over our progress toward that growth and toward that EBITDA number that would get them $5 million. And John did. And it took, I think it was three years to get to the number. And then of course it takes about a year to sell a business of that size. So it was probably a four to five year process. And that's not untypical. That's what private equity does. Yeah. And, and it's a very good strategy if you have time on your side. And we know that there's some small business owners that face a life crisis or just a personal change that they, they have to get a deal done now, right? But if you're listening to the show and you own a small business and you're thinking, eventually I'd like to exit, or sell my business, that you can do that strategically. You don't have to wait until the minute you go to sell. And you don't even have to wait until you're going to sell to understand what the business value is worth. Um, there's lots of advisors, business brokers, others that can do a price opinion on your business and help you understand what that number is. And then you at least know where the gap is. Yeah. And sometimes it's not even the earnings that are the problem. There could be other issues that we have to address before we sell your business for a top value. There could be customer concentration issues. There could be facility or, or, or lease issues. There could be capacity issues. There could be uh, management issues. You have too much of your family in there. We've seen it all. Yeah, there's lots of lots of issues. And we are going to have an upcoming show diving deeper into that. But again, the theme of this show is growth. Using Brian's story as a growth example. Using, if you're thinking about growth too, using new tech's update, there is so much capital available on the streets right now that if you need growth capital in order to hit the next level, now's the time. It is time to grow. As we come out of this pandemic, we are also seeing that a lot of businesses that were here before the pandemic are now gone or under capacity or don't have the right tools in place. This is a time where you could take advantage and grow. And plus the baby boomers, we've talked about it ad nauseum, we are starting to see them come to the marketplace because they're calling us. 
Yes. Yep. And we go over that too. If you haven't had a chance, we have um, a few episodes back. It's called the ultimate guide to buying a business. We've taken all of our best buying tips. So if you're thinking about growth through acquisition, that's a really great series too, but two great interviews, another great episode of the deal board. What do you say we get to it, Andy? Let's get to it. Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. Welcome back, everybody. And I'm really excited today because we have a very special guest with us. We have Brian Clayton, who is an entrepreneur. He is the CEO and co-founder of GreenPal, which is an online marketplace that connects homeowners with local lawn care professionals. GreenPal has been called the Uber for lawn care by Entrepreneur Magazine and has over 100,000 active users completing thousands of transactions per day. Before starting GreenPal, Brian founded Peachtree Inc., one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, growing into over $10 million a year in annual revenue, which is no small feat, before it was acquired by Lusa Holdings in 2013. Brian's interests and expertise are related to entrepreneurialism, small business growth, marketing and bootstrapping from zero revenue to profitability, and what we're going to talk about today to exit. So Brian, thank you for joining us on the deal board and welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So, I mean, I just gave the listeners a whole big background about you, but in your own words, just, just tell us who you are, where you're from, kind of what you're passionate about, right? Yeah. So currently I'm the CEO of a company called Green Pal, which is like the Uber for lawn mowing. You're a homeowner. You need to get your grass cut. You just download our app. Somebody comes and mows it the next day. That's what I've been working on for eight years. I've gotten this business over 200,000 people using it, $20 million a year in revenue. Uh, so we're your eight year overnight success. And believe it or not, uh, I, my first business was actually a lawn mowing business. I, I started mowing grass in high school as a way to make extra cash. I was actually forced into uh, entrepreneurialism by my father. He said, hey, get off your butt. You've got a job to do. You're going to go mow the neighbor's yard today. And uh, ever since then, I was just hooked. I was hooked on owning my own business, on running my own show. And, and by the end of that first summer, uh, I had like 12 customers that I was cutting yards for. And I just kept with that little business all through high school, all through college. And when I graduated college, I had to make a decision. Was I going to stop mowing yards and go into the job market and take a pay cut, basically, or just stick with this lawn mowing business? Didn't really want to be a, a grass cutting guy my whole life. That's not what I went to school for, but made a little business plan. And over a 15-year period of time, I built that into a real landscaping company. Uh, had over 150 employees, got it over $10 million a year in revenue, one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee where I live. And in 2013, that that company was acquired by one of the largest landscaping businesses in the United States in one of the largest acquisitions in that industry in a decade. So growing that business just from me and a push mower to me and 150 people and seeing it all the way through to exit, I, I learned a lot about, you know, how to, how to build a business the wrong way and then how to build it the right way. And uh, it was a hell of a journey. Yeah. Well, I mean, I applaud you too, because a, a lot of people get you know, forced into entrepreneurship or, and then you hear lawn care a lot, right. Of teenagers having to go out and mow on, but very few people are able to build that to a $10 million a year company, which is, I said, no small feat, very hard to do. So, I mean, as you know, our audience is interested in, in buying and selling companies and probably most interested in, in your growth to exit story. So kind of my first question is like, when did it first pop in your mind with Peachtree that you, this was something you were going to exit. This is something you were you, you were planning on selling or preparing to sell. Over a 15-year period of time of running that company, building it from scratch, I, I really learned something about myself that business is the thing that causes me to level up. It is kind of the drumbeat of my life. It is the thing that lends purpose to my life. It's the thing that causes me to learn things I don't want to learn, do things I don't want to do, uh, watch podcasts I don't want to listen to, uh, you know, you watch stuff on YouTube that I really don't want to, I'd rather be watching Netflix, but I need to watch YouTube, right? So business is the thing that 
causes me to, to, to do all of these things. And, and I had reached a plateau of personal growth running that company. I had built it. It's not like I, I conquered it or anything like that, but I had built it to be a big company in my market. And I had done it for 15 years and it was time for me personally to, to set off and, and, and do the next thing. And so that's kind of was the, the, the impetus for why I decided to, to pursue an exit. Now that said, uh, from the moment I made that decision to the moment I, I, we got a deal done was two years, mm-hmm. two long agonizing years, because the day you make the decision to sell your business uh, and, and you're still running it, it's, it's kind of like you're almost in a marriage and you know you're going to get a divorce kind of thing. It, it was hard. It was really difficult knowing that the thing was no longer going to be my baby, but I was still working my butt off trying to make it as good as it could be. So two years of just getting the business ready to sell, being really humbled with, you know, how you think the process is going to go and how it actually goes. And, and, uh, luckily this stuck, stuck, stuck with it and got the deal done. And, and, uh, every, it was a win-win for everybody and my employees, me and the choir. And, and, uh, we, luckily we picked the right people to, to buy the company, but, uh, it was, it was tough. That was the hard, one of the hardest things I've ever done was getting that business sold. Yeah. I mean, and, and you speak a lot to it. it. It is, it's like the day you decide it's not that you check out, right. But you go to a mentally different place, right. That right. you're going to be exiting versus growing and bootstrapping and all that kind of stuff. So w- what you say was one of the hardest things you've ever done. Like, what are some lessons that you took out of that process that you would tell our listeners, Hey, just be aware of this or educate yourself around this. Like what are, what were some of the things that you wish you would have known going into that? Well, One thing I wish I had done differently that I would have known was that, hey, if you uh, have dreams of selling your business, first build a business that could be sold. Uh, And by that, I mean, get it to a certain revenue, get it, put the systems in place, build it in such a fashion to where somebody else could buy it. Great book is called Build to Sell that you can read that is kind of like the the Holy Bible, that sort of thing. At least, at least it, it, uh, looking back, I wish I had that book. Um, That said, you know, running your business uh, as as it is yours versus running it as as you are trying to get it sold are completely different. Um, when you are trying to sell a business, you need to be cutting every single expense you can because whatever whatever your net profit is is that's the multiple you're going to get. And so it could be times four, five, seven, eight, whatever. But uh, you're going to get a multiple on EBITDA most likely. And so you really have to run your business as lean and almost in such a short-sighted fashion as possible. Whereas, you know, when I was building a business for, for like the long haul, 10, 20 years, I would make long-term decisions. I would make decisions, you know, that, that, that had long-term implications that may not pay off for another five years, but I was constantly thinking the long game. When you make the decision to sell your business, you really kind of have to think short-term. You might want to put a Band-Aid on, on something before you go out and just buy it, uh, replacing it. Or you might, uh, you, you, I mean, it's, it's going to sound crappy saying this, but you might make some short-sighted decisions as it relates to clientele, because you know that that uh, you have to save that money today, and you can't afford to have a three or four year payback. And so, it's a really different m- philosophy and mentality of running a business that you know you're going to sell versus running a business that maybe your kids are going to have one day. I, you know, I couldn't have said it better myself, but I love how you t- you talked about too. It's like every dollar you save gets dropped to the bottom line, and you get a multiple up, right? So, and and we talk a lot about too, we know that business owners try new things, like they might have a test marketing budget and may or may not work out, but when you're getting ready to sell, probably not the year to do it. So I I love that. And I love that mentality. It's a, it's a different mindset you have when you're getting ready to sell versus still growing it for the long long term, or like you said, for legacy for your kids. Right. So, yeah. So let's jump a little bit forward to time. So you got the deal done. You said you were really happy with the buyers, right? How did that transition process go for you guys? That was another thing that was, was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be because when you, when something is yours for 15 years and you, you create it from scratch and you really to make it in business, let's face it, you have to pour your life's energy and soul into that company or else it's not going to get off the ground. Mm-hmm. That's how it was for me with my business and, and my, you know, hundreds plus employees were kind of my family. We had a really, really good culture. And so the day that, you know, that's no longer yours, 
um, to use the marriage analogy again, it's kind of like, it's it's, it's kind of like, okay, now you're still kind of married, but maybe you're divorced, but you're still living in the house and the new husband or new spouse is in the house too. Um, except for he doesn't listen to anything you say about what your wife (laughs) likes. And so it's, it's really bizarre. It's like, it's a weird thing that you just got to go through. Um, It's no longer, it's no longer your baby. You have to, you have to like come to grips with that. And so there's like an emotional thing that I I didn't realize was, was gonna, was going to occur that did for me. It was kind of like, okay, what now? This has been my identity for almost, you know, 16 years. What a, what am I now? You know, do I work here? what, What am I doing? And so, that took a long time, six, seven months for me to kind of process and internalize. And, uh, and finally came the realization that there was only so much I could do. Like I'm helping with the transition, but at the end of the day, these people bought my company because quite frankly, they had better systems. They had better economics of scale. They had better ways of doing things. And I kind of had to let go and let them do what they were going to do and just kind of help shepherd that process. And uh, it was one that I was not uh, totally prepared for emotionally, and, and I just kind of had to wing it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because you, you bring up an, another good point is there there is an emotional process to that transition and letting go. And we see uh, a lot of small business owners, and I've been in, in the same position myself where your identity is the business, right? So how do you reshape that identity or, or transition your role to something different where you, you still find like you're getting your purpose and you're, you're getting some good satisfaction in your life and your career. So when you're going through this process, were you thinking about your new venture or was this something that came up after the fact, like after you'd had some time to settle and, and maybe even hopefully celebrate the success of selling a little bit? Yeah. You know, to get the business to a point where it could be sold and then getting that deal done was just like 110% of my bandwidth. It was everything I could do. I mean, it was seven days a week, sometimes is in like 15 hour days, especially going through due diligence, like just trying to get that deal worked, worked out to get it, uh, to get it closed. And so really that's all I was focused on. And then, and then like post-closing was still a ton of work trying to reinsure employees, um, trying to, uh, you just teach, train my replacement, um, working with, with the, the acquires. And so that it was like everything I could do. But then when the smoke cleared, then it was like this onset of, okay, what now I'm like basically retired at that point. I didn't have to work anymore so I could do what I wanted to do. And so then I took some time off and went through like another growth period where it's like, wow, okay, really, you know, happiness for me comes from purpose. And, and so my, wow, my business was my purpose. Now it's gone. Now I have no purpose. Holy crap. I need to start a new business. And so the idea for my, my business now green pal was, was one that was just obvious for me. Like I, I, I saw what Uber and Airbnb were doing, you know, with these real world transactions and mm-hmm. leveraging technology to make them smoother. And so I recruited two co-founders and we went to work on green pal and, and, I had that purpose again. I had the mission. I, and so I was happy again. And, and, uh, it was harder than I thought it was going to be, you know, luckily that naivete got me into the game on that one, but, but, uh, been at this one for eight years. And, and so now I ha- I don't have that kind of like, like absence or hole in my, in my life anymore. Like green power is now my purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And you said it earlier, like your purpose, like it's not the same for everybody, but your purpose was business and business made you level up. Right. So that's where you really drew a lot of your energy from. So it makes sense to jump into something else. So now you're at it again and green pals, even scaling faster and bigger than Peachtree was. So, I mean, like what, what's your secret? How do you get started on these businesses when, when you have no money and grow them so quickly? Yeah, I think it's a combination of of, of working on your business and in your business and being, and being willing to do both of those and, and being like my, I've had business partners in the past that were really good, like in it guys, Mm -hmm. they would work seven days a week, 14 hours a day, whatever it took to make the job happen, whatever to get it done. But they weren't really good at working on the business. And, and, and so that might mean like, okay, rather than like, you know, you have to get in the truck and go do that thing. Like we got to figure out why that, went wrong and let's build a process to prevent that. And so being willing to like in the early days work in the business really hard and then set aside time to work on it. And then as like a, like a, like a sliding scale, as time goes on, you're less in it and more on it. I think is like, for me, 20 years of business, getting two businesses to, to eight figures is, has been one of the things that has made sense, but I have 
I have made the mistake of delegating too quickly. Uh, like with GreenPal, when we started it, we didn't know how to code. We didn't know how to write software. And so we, we paid a shop to build like what we thought GreenPal should be. And it was a total flop. We wasted like, like $150,000 and we delegated too quickly. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. So we had to work in the business. We had to learn how to write software, learn how to do this stuff to where we could then delegate it. And like getting that just right, where you're doing stuff yourself, like you have an org chart of like 20 different roles and your name's on every role. Yeah. And then like as time pe- goes goes on, you're peeling your name off of some of these roles and, and, and understanding how to like master the 80, 20 of these things. And then, and then as soon as you get it, and as soon as you get a little bit of money, delegate that to somebody else, a contractor, freelancer, an employee, whatever. And then, and then just like rinse and repeat that and, and, and just, and just look at it almost like a video game. There's 10 levels to this and you just got to get through level one. And now you just got to get through level two. Don't worry about Bowser. He doesn't matter. Just get through level three. Looking back 20 years is kind of, kind of how it's uh, uh, unfolded for me. Yeah. Well, I like it because it's simple too. It's right. It's, it's right out the org chart. It's move one level to the next, but I I do like that you also brought up not to delegate too quickly because sometimes we see that happen too, especially in small businesses where the owner has been working in the business for so long. Right. And there's so many processes and procedures up here in their head and not necessarily written down or even taught to, to other um, people in the company. So what do you see as the biggest challenges that you've faced with GreenPal and, and you're going to maybe even face in the future as you continue to scale this new company? Yeah, one of the biggest challenges for us is, you know, with my first business, it was a landscaping company and it was a hard business. Like you mentioned, it's, a lot of people don't scale a business like that, um, but I would go to like conferences and, uh, and, and and when I would go to a conference, I would meet with the biggest landscaping company in that in that city. So I remember one year I went to a conference in Chicago and the, the, this guy was doing like $80 million a year in revenue in landscaping in Chicago. And he showed me their processes, their systems, gave me a tour of the shop and let me, you know, let, let me hang out with them for, for a day. So my point is I was able to learn from, from somebody who had kind of already done what it was I was trying to do and I could kind of learn and maybe even do it a little better. With GreenPal, it, it does not exist. So we're kind of inventing a new product, inventing a new a new uh, process, inventing a new experience, inventing a new user behavior. And so that's a, like an order of magnitude harder. And I think a lot of uh, on, budding entrepreneurs in this kind of generation, like uh, uh, particularly tech entrepreneurs, under index on, yeah, you're starting a business that's hard, but you're also inventing a brand new product that does not exist. And so don't underestimate that. There's a big difference between starting a business and getting it off the ground. That's hard. But it's right. another level of magnitude harder to like do that and invent a new product or new experience. And so that's one was one of our challenges in the early days. So it took us like three, four years just to get this thing going. Like we didn't pay ourselves any paychecks for three years because uh, we were still trying to figure out how to get the damn thing to work for, for both sides of the transaction. And so that was one of our biggest challenges in the early days. Mm. And it makes sense too, is if you're inventing a prop, product, there is no like I call it grip off and duplicate method, right? You can't go see how it's working in the marketplace. Maybe there's something similar, but not exactly what you're designing. So right. yeah, I mean, giving yourself as an entrepreneur some credit, some breathing room that, that it is a, it's two challenges you're fighting. So, One thing um, that I did that helped me yeah. was I, I, I drove for Uber, drove for Lyft, walked dogs for Postmates, cleaned houses on Handy and HomeJoy, um, delivered food for DoorDash. I did all of these things to learn like, okay, these are, these guys are doing something similar. Let me look at how they're building their products. Let me look at how they're like crafting the experience. And so I was able to kind of learn from, from those similar companies, but yeah, there, there was no like, okay, they're, they're doing exactly what I want to do here. Let me just copy it and do it here. There wasn't that. And so just like, understand that if you're listening to this, and you want to start the next big app that it, there, it's, it's, it's difficult to invent something from scratch. Hey, I love that you're cleaning for Handy and driving for Uber. I mean, talk about market research and really being dedicated to see what the user experience is going to be on each side of the transaction. So that's amazing. I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs would even think of that, but it, it is an avenue you can take. Um, yeah, it, so. re- it really sucked when I delivered a cheeseburger to my ex-girlfriend's house one time <laughs> and her new boyfriend answered the door. That uh, sucked. So yeah. yeah, it was humbling. That's the one beautiful thing about business. It's like the best humble 
machine that you're ever going to like get the experience. (laughs) Very, very true. Well, so I want to pivot uh, right now and give some of our listeners a tactical takeaway. So, um, you know, you've already mentioned one book, but it seems like you're an avid learner in the business world. You know, what books have you read that you would recommend to our listeners about how, you know, that have helped you grow these businesses and and sell sell Peachtree as well? Yeah, uh, one of my favorite quotes is Mark Zuckerberg. He says, don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all. Mm-hmm. Like, that dude, like, whatever you think about him, like, dude was running, like, like a $100 billion company when he was 27 or 28. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's yeah. just insane. Yeah. Um, so if you can kind of, like, take that ethos and make it part of your philosophy, too, you don't know everything, and you need to be a learn-it-all, whether it's by people around you or books or audio books or, or podcasts, YouTube. The good news is, is like, it's easier to learn this stuff. This, this knowledge is so much more accessible today than it's ever been. It's, there's just no excuse not to, to constantly be, be trying to enrich your brain to, to compete. Uh, for me, some, some awesome books, uh, like I mentioned, Built to Sell, uh, Good to Great is another uh, awesome calling. book that has got yep. timeless fundamentals in it, like the flywheel effect. Um, uh, just just in terms of of philosophies on how to like run your life and run your business, the seven habits of highly effective people is a, is a one of my favorite books. And then like a very tactical book is the E Myth by Michael Gerber. Anybody just trying to start a business from scratch right now, you know, you can you can read that book. It's kind of a blueprint for for how to get a business going. Yeah, I love this. I mean, the E Myth is almost what you're talking about with the video game analogy of you know getting the processes in place, putting a person in, delegating and moving on. They're all, all some of my favorites too, Brian. I appreciate it. None of these are my ideas. I've stole them from somebody, every single one of them. <laughs> I don't think any of us have any like original, original ideas anymore, right? <laughs> so what's next for you, Brian, and for Green Pal? How can we get in touch with you? How can we support you? What, yeah. What so uh, anybody listening to this that doesn't want to waste time cutting their grass or plowing their snow, uh, Green Pal, you can just download it in the App Store or Play Store. You'll get hooked up with a great service provider in less than a couple of minutes. Uh, anybody who wants to reach me, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. I've been hanging out there a lot more lately. Nice. Nice. Well, we'll drop those uh, links into our show notes too. I am going to reach out about the snow removal too. I'm in Colorado and that's super helpful. (laughs) (laughs) Right on. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Brian, thank you so much for joining us on the deal board. We really enjoyed having you on. Hey, I had a ball. Thanks for having me on. Hey, Andy, do you know what time it is? It's time for our deal of the week. Deal of the week. Sold. Hey everybody, welcome back. And we are talking deal of the week. And we have Jenna Porzillo here from Trans World Business Advisors of Bel Air, Maryland. And she has a great deal that she closed. Uh, we are seeing an explosion in the beverage and in the brewery business, home brewery, and uh, just love these businesses. And we're seeing them pop up across the United States. And you had one for sale. You must have gotten a lot of uh, a lot of buyers to look at it. Yes, it was a really fun listing too. And with COVID, obviously the liquor and booze and alcohol industry, that's a defense-based industry. So they were still doing well with COVID. You know, a few owners had purchased this brewery and they all had other jobs and they just wanted to get out. They found out it was too much. They knew they weren't doing this place justice. So they actually, their lease was going to expire in Mm. a short period of time. I think they only had six months, I believe, to work. And we found a buyer the month before their lease ended. So they were going to just close shop. But this business had been in business for 30 years. So it was really a community staple. Some of these recipes at this brewery were known and their special people came for these recipes. It was a big part of the community. So we had a buyer who was interested in home brewery and he, him and his wife fell in love with this store and they purchased it. They came with a lot of experience. They also plan to build it up and do a lot more than what's been done. And they are just on cloud nine with it now. Wow, that that sounds great. I mean, listen, a business that's been around for 30 years, I love stories like that because, you know, that's something that has goodwill, that has something in returning customers, all those good things. And it sounds like you found the perfect buyer for them. So, you know, good deals for good people, as we say, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Even the people who sold are so happy to still have it in the community. And part of the reason I love being a broker is being able to save companies that are going to close, especially ones that are such a deep part of the community. That's really important and part of my biggest values 
of being a broker and a lot of the reason why I do what I do. So Excellent. It, was nice to see it come to fruition and also to be able to still go, they have samplings you can taste. They teach you how to make your own wine and fermenting. So it's just a really fun store. Sounds like a great deal. And if somebody wants to do more deals with you, Jenna, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Sure. My number is 443-694-5013. And you are welcome to text or call that number. And if email is your preference, my email is jporzillo at tworld.com. That's J-P-O-R-Z-I-L-L-O. Excellent. Thanks for coming on today and bringing that great deal. That was a great deal. Yeah, it was. Thank you for having me, Andy. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And I have a returning guest. I have Barry Sloan of New Tech Business Services, and he is the CEO. You've seen him on TV talking uh, on Fox News, on CNBC, on uh, certainly uh, several other news channels. But Barry has a, a few things going on. And listen, this is post-COVID. We're kind of rolling out of this now. And there's all kinds of opportunities out there. And I know, Barry, welcome. I know you're bringing out a new, a new business service, a new line of credit for people that's outside. Listen, we could talk about SBA all, all day long, and we have. So let's talk about something else. Let's talk about some of the new services you have at New Tech. Thanks, Andy. And, and look, I, I think uh, we've been a public company for over 23 years. We're the nation's largest non-bank SBA lender, third largest in SBA loans. And many of you are familiar with that product. But with the current environment and business valuations <laughs> rising, we recognize that there clearly was a need for larger loans. So we'll be rolling out a term loan program, single digit interest rate, 10 to 25 year AM scheduled with loan balances up to 15 million. So um, for people looking for financing, for business acquisitions, acquiring the real estate, uh, maybe that they've been uh, paying rental rent on uh, historically, we've got great loan programs up to 15 million, well beyond the $5 million SBA cap uh, with single digit rates of interest. And that could be done for business acquisitions, preferably collateralized by commercial real estate. But if it's cash flow only and the cash flow is strong, we could look at that as well. The value prop, not too dissimilar from what we're used to in small business lending, no balloons, 10 to 25 year AM schedules, no covenants, and a willingness to over advance on the primary collateral. So that's very typical of what we've seen in the SBA space historically. Well, now we're taking it up two notches. We're going from five to 10 to 15 million. We also can do partial or ground up rehab. So clearly it would be something that uh, we're excited about. We do these loans in all 50 states, come in through your Transworld uh, broker and we'll be glad to help. Obviously New Tech is doing a great job. And you know, this kind of financing just hasn't been out there historically. I mean. SBA financing was really one of the only places to go to leverage a business uh, sale and e even the real estate for a business. I mean, especially, you know, single use uh, properties that businesses are often in. And so for you to come out with a product that gets you up to 10 million, 15 million, I think we're going to see a lot of bigger deals. And, you know, with baby boomers going, to, going out and retiring perhaps after this COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be perfect time for business owners to sell them people to buy. Well, you know, Andy, one of the things you said also made me think about, in addition to the balance being not conforming with an SBA program, many of you have borrowers that have used their $5 million of SBA borrowing up and they need to borrow another million or 2 million. Many of you have borrowers that don't occupy 50% of the real estate, but occupy 40%. Some of you have borrowers where there's PGs, but you can't get it on three people that own 33 and a third percent. Maybe you have it on two. This program fits that as well. So it's good for the small balance. It's good for the big balance. This is a program that fits borrowers that do not conform to an SBA standard. There's nobody more in touch with the small business community than you and the folks at New Tech. 
And so you're obviously doing this because you're seeing the need, right? You see a lot of small business owners and, you know, I'm fascinated by, I think I, I'm predicting that there's going to be like kind of like this whiplash effect that we're coming out of this COVID crisis. A lot of companies aren't prepared to scale up like they're going to need to scale. And there's things that are just not going to come back uh, the way they were. So what are you seeing out there? The, the amount of fiscal and monetary stimulus uh, and the U.S. economy is obviously unprecedented. It's hard to be kept obvious, but the Fed keeping rates at zero to 25 basis points on the short end, um, a $1.9 trillion COVID program, followed by discussions of two to $4 trillion of infrastructure, followed by checks going into people's hands. Uh, recently, on the recent COVID bill that passed on the 1.9 trillion. Now they're talking about in the infrastructure bill, part of the infrastructure bill is to actually just write checks to people. And it's getting a little crazy, okay? And I'm not here to figure out five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. We do go quarter to quarter, we do try to plan for the long term, but the amount of government involvement and takeover of business is unprecedented, it's off the charts, it's going to be a business boom. We all need to be careful. Don't get over levered. Don't get over extended operationally uh, to make sure you can always pay your bills. Those are the people that will win long term, but it's going to be a boom. It's going to be absolutely crazy. And don't also, if you can get ahead of the expense curve, make sure you've got the supplies that you need because they're going to be in short supply. Yeah, well, there, and, and things are going to go up, right? There's got to be some inflation that's going to come out of this. And what I, what, I, what I saw in one of your recent posts, I think it was Nolan who was sending around the recent post, uh, you mentioned it a little bit about expen expense reduction. We're seeing things like uh, legal costs and IT costs and insurance costs just go up and up and up. And I see that new tech is helping people save money on a lot of those things. Yeah, I think that the other aspect of what we do, obviously, providing the financing to do acquisitions, to lower your cost of debt, to um, rehab and refurbish facilities and real estate, all very valuable. But we de very much deal with the other side of the business owner's balance sheet. And I'll say this, particularly for A, business brokers that want additional sources of income apart from buying and selling businesses, partnering with us to go in and do an analysis on someone's IT, do an analysis, is their website current, functional, found, secure, taking a look at their payroll health and benefits to make sure that they're priced correctly, looking at every single insurance policy. We, whether it's the end business owner or the trans world advisor, we do all the heavy lifting. Connect us to the client. We'll do all the heavy lifting for the chance to win the business. At worst, we go back to the client and say, you've got the best policies. You've got the best health insurance. Um, your website is absolutely perfect. And by the way, how you've got your IT structure is magnificent. That's the worst that happens. You've got validation that everything that you're doing is right. So even when... We lose, customer wins, the trans world advisor wins. In the case where you could actually bring a better solution, which happens quite frequently with us, we've been doing this for 23 years, and this, particularly the technology, the solutions are changing, you're going to make, get an income stream and the customer is going to reduce their expense and become more efficient. So there's a lot of things that we can do partnering with the trans world advisors, and we would hope that their business model has obviously those great episodic sales and listings as well as reoccurring revenue from our transactions. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, there's a lot of opportunities at new tech. I, you know, listen, uh, new tech was our partner in 1999. Uh, we worked with new tech to finance trans world's expansion across Florida and eventually into our franchise. And uh, we would not be here without new tech so there's a lot of opportunities for small businesses to work with you. And 
of course, you know, they could call us a trans world, but uh, they could go right to new tech as well. So, you know, we, we, we thank you, Barry, for coming on. Uh, you always have insight into the business world. Any last parting words? No, I wish I could go back to 1999. <laughs> we thought the world was going to end with Y2K. <laughs> And it, we screwed up. We lasted another 20 years. <laughs> yeah, listen, I, you know, we always, uh, Y2K and uh, unfortunately 9-11 at that time. And then we yeah. come through the, you know, the credit crisis of 2009 through say 10. And uh, here we are uh, going through the COVID crisis and we're going to come out. If there's one thing that we've learned, the world goes on and there's opportunities out there and uh, we're here, we're here to help you. And of course, New Tech is too. Barry, thank you for coming on today. I appreciate it. Andy, a pleasure. Look forward to the pasta dinner coming up. <laughs> 2022. Thank you. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for listing of the week. Welcome back, everybody, to the deal board. And we have a great listing to feature this week. I want to welcome Sam Curcio from Transworld Business Advisors of New York. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Jessica. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about this business that you're selling. Yeah, so Jessica, this is a uh, a clothing retailer uh, in New York City here. They have uh, three locations and they're setting the standard for a green solution to clothing shopping. This mm -hmm. uh, company actually hand selects vintage pieces to ensure the highest quality and most on-trend clothing available to their customers. Uh, a strength of this business has shown through uh, COVID actually this past year with, with monthly sales uh, stronger month over month versus 2019. Uh, there's also a strong management team in place that has allowed the owner to step away from the day-to-day -day operations and focus on high level strategy and growth. Uh, another great opportunity is that this business uh, has a, a mostly re uh, retail following, but they do about 20% of their sales online, which can be expanded upon. Uh, the vintage and secondhand market as a segment is actually expected to have compounded growth through 2025. Uh, and this, uh, this company actually maintains margins well above the industry uh, average. Wow. So, I mean, it sounds like a great business. You got management in place that, you know, did well through COVID and it has great growth opportunities. Tell us a little bit about the numbers and the metrics. Yeah, the owner has definitely built a, an amazing business here. Uh, so the business has total sales of just over $3.5 million, uh, with a discretionary earnings of over $1.6 million. The owner is currently asking $8 million for this business with a down payment of $6.5 million. Uh, though this business is now uh, pre-qualified by two SBA lenders, so that's very exciting. And it will come with about $225,000 worth of inventory. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that this business has been around for the last 10 years. Wow, good history, good numbers, and you know, financing pre-qualified that opens it up to a lot of buyer options um, for smaller down payments. So Sam, it sounds like a great business. If anyone wants to learn more or maybe contact you about buying or selling a business in general in New York, how would they reach you? The best way to reach me is to give me a call at 646-470. 9433, or you can reach me at S-C-U-R-C-I-O at tworld.com. Great. And we'll drop that information into the show notes too. Sam, thank you so much for coming back on the show. We look forward for you to come back and tell us about this deal when it, once it's closed, but good luck and join us again soon. Thanks so much, Jessica. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you like the podcast, share it with your friends on social media. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. If you have questions, would like to appear, or have suggestions for topics for the show, get in contact with us through our website, thedealboardpodcast.com.